bring animals into their world, humans often give them a status at one of two extremes. The animal as king, humanized, sometimes to the point of absurdity, where any anthropomorphic excess is possible. The animal as object, reduced to the rank of a thing, used, exploited, manipulated. From the idea of play to the idea of being useful, between plaything and laboratory tool, what place do we offer animals in our societies? Whereas the idea of animal plaything doesn't shock us, laboratory animals are a sensitive subject which causes strong emotional responses in public opinion. The questions raised are both ethical and scientific. Because we can ask ourselves if, with progress in biology, scientific imaging, or virtual modeling, can animal experiments be replaced by alternative methods? Are laboratory animals still indispensable to modern science, or are they already a thing of the past? Animal experimentation is a subject which provokes passionate arguments between defenders of animal rights and those who consider laboratory animals as a necessary evil for the advance of science. It's a subject which touches the general public. Animal lovers, people that share their lives with animals, find animal experimentation traumatic. The principal objective of animal experimentation, at least in the public mind, is biomedical research, and therefore everything which involves sickness and death, and so there is a kind of self-projection into sickness and into death which leads to rejection of this practice. The other aspect, doubtless, is the fact that there is a kind of contradictory association between one of the most noble and specifically human ideas, that is the advancement of knowledge, and the fact that in in the framework of that advance, an animal will be made to suffer. There is a hierarchy of emotional values for animals used in laboratories. We can see that the public is quite insensitive to rodents, quite indifferent to the pig, which is an extremely affectionate animal, and that the public is devastated by the use of dogs, cats or primates. In reality, interest for animals is driven by an anthropocentric vision, which means that it is centered on mankind. Humans have a tendency to only be interested in animals which are close to us or which resemble us, in such a way that the ethical attention of man to animals is established in concentric circles, a kind of downwards gradient, which means that the further away an animal is from us in its shape, its behavior, the less interested in it we are. So, close to us, we find obviously household pets, dogs, cats, and next comes horses or the great apes, then farmyard animals, and and then birds, next reptiles, followed by fish, and after that, well, then there's the vast, immense population, which is around 95% of the living world, the invertebrates, the insects, which nobody really cares much for, except for specialists. Animal experimentation is a social question which forces us to reflect on our relationship with other living creatures and on the hierarchy of the living world which we establish. For centuries, the animal world and humanity have been kept carefully separate. Human beings were far and away the most intelligent and sensitive creatures and refused any possibility that the beasts could have intelligence, sensitivity or emotions. However, through their experiments, Scientists are proving little by little that the frontier between the two worlds is not as uncrossable as was thought. Just like us, animals learn, memorize, imitate, communicate, feel and dream. 
From this point on, our attitude to animals and the way in which we treat them can only change. Discussion about the possibility of replacing, reducing and rationalizing the use of laboratory animals was begun at the end of the 1950s. This was the theory of the three R's, developed by two English researchers, William Russell and Rex Birch, who formalized their ideas on animal experimentation, working from dual ethical and scientific points of view. They urged the scientific community to replace animal experimentation by using other methods, to reduce the number of animals used, and to rationalize experimental protocols to limit the suffering inflicted upon animals. The question of suffering is central as, for public opinion, Animal experimentation is above all another way of saying trauma and pain. Even if attention was mostly centered on mammals, the ethical question of suffering exists for all living creatures, even for those that mankind considers to be less evolved. After having demonstrated that some invertebrate animals could feel pain, we managed to get the new European directive to take cephalopods into consideration, for the European community to recognize them as sensitive beings and which are now protected like vertebrates are. Anesthesia is the most common method of limiting the suffering of animals during experiments. I'm quite shocked by the reactions to this subject that can be heard about scientists who are sometimes accused of being sadists, heartless people who torture animals. No, it's untrue for one simple reason, and that is that a mistreated animal endangers the validity of the experiment, if only for that. But there are other reasons. Researchers are attentive to the well-being of the animal. Furthermore, they do all they can, everything that is possible, so that the animal is damaged as little as possible during the experiment they make upon it. Despite the adoption of the three R's rule by the scientific community, science still uses a lot of animals. 12 million a year for the 27 countries of the European Union, of which more than 80% are rodents. However, the reliability of animal experimentation can be questioned. Are results of tests on animals capable of being applied to man? In order to limit the risks of error in such extrapolation, some research is trying to rely rather on direct observation of human subjects. This is the main aim of a new study in respiratory toxicology being developed by Professor Gret Schurters. By our research on exhaled breaths, we do observations in humans to see what happens in the airways. And we especially focus on children because they are a vulnerable uh, population and they suffer from uh, respiratory diseases. One out of three has asthma or allergies. And by looking at the exhaled breath, we try to see what happens in the airways. Once when we have the breath samples of the children, we analyze them 
and we get a spectrum which, uh, where you can see the different molecules which are present and we can identify which chemicals are present here. It's on the chemical molecules identified in the breath of children that Professor Gretschertes will concentrate her research upon by developing a very specific method. Well, we culture uh, airway cells which come from human airways and we culture them and then we expose them to chemicals which are present in the environment. And we can see which effects the chemicals have on these cells. And this we can compare with what you observe uh, in the children. With this equipment, we simulate exposure of uh, the human lungs to air with chemicals. And uh, what we do is we put the cells in these little wells and they get air with chemicals on top of it. And underneath there, will, there is some liquid and that simulates the body fluid. For respiratory toxicology, it's especially important to work on human cells because there is no good animal model available. The metabolism in an animal is different from in humans for many chemicals and also animals don't live that long. So while humans can be exposed for many years to a chemical, it's very difficult to simulate that uh, by animal tests. So uh, that complicates the extrapolation from animals to humans. Today, certain cell culture techniques allow the complete replacement of animal testing. In total, 30 or so alternative methods are used in Europe, of which two-thirds concern cosmetics. The search for alternative methods of testing cosmetic products has also been stimulated by more restrictive legislation. Animal testing was banned in 2004 for finished products. Since 2009, legislation applies to all the ingredients used in their composition. For the last 20 years, Oriol Research Laboratories have been working towards making human corneas or skin tissue from cell cultures. These tissues, made in laboratories, are now used instead of animals to test for dermal irritation, corrosion and phototoxicity. We can thus measure the effects of a product in different forms – liquid, cream, paste or powder. So we have before us a panel of different kinds of artificial skin tissues, ranging from the least to the most sophisticated. We've got here what is called total artificial skin with living epidermis and living dermis, two cell types, and if another cell type is added, melanocyte, which will give us melanin, skin pigment, then we have here skin which can get a suntan. It's still quite incredible nowadays, and yet it isn't the first time that we've ever seen this kind of skin grown from a few cells in a culture and in a fortnight. We get something which looks like skin, so let's see. I'm taking this reconstituted skin apart. On this surface we have what represents the epidermis. 
That's the surface of the skin in contact with the air. And if we turn it over, there's this shinier surface which corresponds to the dermis, which gives skin its resistance. And what we see here is that this skin resistance is both what we find in real life and enables us to apply cosmetic products. For example, lipstick or pasty substances that are difficult to apply. Well, the surface has to be strong enough to have the substances put on it, then spread out to imitate real-life situations. So, after having frozen this skin at minus 180 degrees centigrade, we'll cut them. This is a slicer, like a ham slicer such as we have at home, except that these are slices only a few microns thick, so we can observe skin changes microscopically after they've been in contact with the product. We can see here the different structures of artificial skin, starting from the most external part, the layer of hard skin, the epidermis, and the deepest part, which is the dermis. So with this kind of cut, we can observe the potential effect of products applied to their surface. After treatment by an irritating substance, we can clearly see the disappearance of the hard skin and the appearance of white spaces which correspond to dead cells and then the destruction of cell layers. Working with artificial human skin gives us more reliable results because, to start with, it's human cells, and further, a lot more refined and directly applicable information is provided with regard to what happens to people. Putting an alternative method in place in Europe could take between three and ten years. If we take as an example the last validation of cutaneous irritation, that took about ten years. At first, the method must be optimized, shared with partners, submitted to European organizations responsible for methodology, and once the method is validated, it has to be applied at a reglementary level, which takes a further two or three years to have the guidelines written and for the methodology to become usable in Europe. This validation period is a crucial debating point which has been revived by the launch by Europe in 2007 of the REACH Toxicology Protection Program. This obliges manufacturers to prove the products they market are non-toxic. Between today and 2025, 30,000 substances will be tested. With this delay, can we manage to validate enough alternative methods to substitute for animal tests? The REACH program was from the start hypocritical, as it had admitted that it would mean a considerable increase in animal experiments, but stated that animals couldn't be used if alternative methods existed, in the full knowledge that such alternative methods didn't exist, and as a result, it was thought that there would be 30 million more animal experiments in 10 years. Actually, it's more like 10 million, but that's still enormous. To measure the effects of chemical products, it must first be known which organs they will affect. Animals are used to follow the route taken of a substance in a complete living organism, which is where cellular tests reach their limits. 
In fact, a cell isn't an isolated island. It belongs to a tissue which is part of an organ linked to other organs to form a complete organism. However, before attaching itself to an organ, a supposedly harmful molecule will pass through different organs and cell structures and can cause collateral damage, which is impossible to see by testing in vitro. However, cellular tests have considerably contributed to the way we can estimate the harmful effects of products and how they act upon us. For a century, manufacturers saw predictive toxicology in terms of what is called lethal dose 50 which means a product is taken and it is seen what dose administered to animals, eventually the dose used on cells, that will cause death in 50% of the animal or cell sample. That is to say, crudely, that toxic doses were aimed for. There's been a total change, and the prevailing idea now is that well before trying to destroy cells or animals, Whatever product it is will modify cellular molecular circuits. And this in such a way that repeated doses or increased doses could effectively lead to lethal toxicity, destroying the cell or the animal. Today, toxicity is no longer seen only in terms of the final effect, but also by the extremely limited disturbance it first causes in normal molecular channels. To be able to work on these channels, it is essential to have laboratory access to human cells with human molecular mechanisms from the main organs which toxicity will affect, liver, heart, kidneys, brain, and also skin and muscles. So stem cells are becoming a tool, a dream tool for this kind of thing that can be produced in the requisite quantity and made to specialize in the tissue that we want. The viewpoint change on predictive toxicology has led to serious limitations, really serious limitations, being placed on what we expect from animal experiments because, of course, we can't completely dispense with studies that take into account the whole organism. We humans, you're not just looking at cardiac tissue or hepatic tissue, but an ensemble of integrated and interlaced systems, and at some point we need to know what will happen to all of it. But before that, we can clear a lot of ground by looking in a laboratory using tools which are a lot closer to human reality because they are human cells and because with human cells we can reproduce organs which are otherwise mostly inaccessible. Nowadays, we could create systems which don't yet exist to study toxicity using stem cells because the reality of human cells isn't accessible in the laboratory except by using stem cells because something very important is that human genetic diversity isn't available to us in the laboratory unless we go to many patients and that's what is done nowadays when a medicine is being tested. Hundreds, even thousands of patients are tested to test genetic diversity. There are patients who will react well, and then eventually there will be patients who react badly, where the toxicity is linked to their genetic heritage. Well, today the possibility exists with stem cells to examine that genetic diversity. What we are not able to examine with stem cells is systemic biology. That is to say, the integration of different organs and life, and in reality, from that point of view, animal experimentation cannot be replaced.
What will always be extraordinary with animal research is that at any moment it can produce responses which were precisely what was not expected, and it's that aspect that's important. Even if man is neither a naked ape or a 70 kilogram rat, scientists seem to say that animal experimentation will be indispensable for a long time in the study of living mechanisms. Animal species aren't chosen at random. We study particular species of animal, those which are as close as possible, to what we think are human ways of functioning, to be able to transpose results to humans as reliably as possible. We can consider that results obtained from animals can be partially extrapolated to humans. This is experimental homology, which means that although no animal is exactly like a human, in the same way that no human is exactly like another human, logical links exist between functional organization in animals and in humans. We are still far from being able to artificially create the complexity of exchanges in an organism, but progress in cell cultures allows us to begin to simulate biological ensembles by linking the cells of some organs in networks. Certainly, by linking them together, these different types of cells or tissues, more or less artificial, we can artificially create some kinds of relationships. But even there, there are limits. We can study exchanges in this way. But frequently, a living organism has to be used, even if it's just to check that what we found in the linkages is valid. While methods that allow us to completely replace animal experimentation are still rare, there are, however, several other possibilities that lead to limiting the use of animals. This is especially the case of medical imagery techniques. It's okay, the rat's anaesthetized. Yes, he's asleep, it's okay. We have on our imaging platform studies which consist in studying the mechanisms of illnesses, following their progression over weeks in the same animal, so using fewer animals, and we're also studying the action mechanisms of new medicines. These medicines could be brain medicines for neurological or psychiatric purposes, and also could be medicines targeted on the cardiovascular system, the pulmonary system, etc. So there, we can clearly see the MRI image of the rat's brain, and so we can completely survey the region that interests us, which allows us to follow changes in this region during the rat's sickness. So this rat, we'll see it again next week, to resurvey this region and thus evaluate the treatment over three weeks. It is estimated that imaging techniques in vivo with small animals use five to ten times less animals than the classic techniques with an invasive approach and tissue sampling. Imaging avoids having to autopsy a different animal at each step of an experiment. On our platform, we have different imaging techniques, the MRI technique, but also others which are called radioactive techniques. Each technique answers questions and can complete one another. One technique gives more anatomical information about the organ structure, the other gives more answers about biological changes in the organ. The image shows clearly the distribution of radioactive tracer within the brain and also at peripheral points. The important thing is our medicine gets into the brain. 
L'intérêt d'une plateforme. L'intérêt d'une plateforme comme la nôtre est que nous pouvons faire des examinations d'images, que ce soit sur des petits animaux comme les mouches et les rats, par exemple, ou sur des modèles plus évolués, plus grands taux, plus évolués, plus grands taux, comme sur les primates, le primate ou le porc, par exemple, et enfin, et enfin, nous pouvons examiner les objets de volontaires humains, les patients ou les gens ordinaires, et donc nous pouvons obtenir un continuum entre les modèles animaux et les modèles humains, le modèle humain, à la fin de la chaîne. Le modèle humain, 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 le modèle
In the use of laboratory animals, things have changed considerably over the last 30 years. And the installation of European regulations in 1986 has upset mindsets in many ways. It has brought attention to the respect of animals, imposed structure on experimentation, which by increasing prices have driven people to avoid using animals in any old way. At the same time, the advance of new methodologies, new techniques, have allowed all these alternative methods to emerge that were extremely rare 30 years ago, of course, and which have grown in number significantly today. 30 years ago, honestly, in experimentation, anyone at all could do anything at all. And it wasn't because there was no regulation, but that about half the experimenters didn't even realize there was regulation. And the arrival of the European Directive of 86-87 led to scientific circles paying much more attention to animals. And thanks to that, the number of animals used has considerably dropped by 40% between 1990 and 2008. At the Vendôme Lycée Professionnel, laboratory animal keepers are trained. What we expect in our young trainees is that they will be first and foremost animal lovers, so as to treat them better, to be able to better evaluate the pain involved in an experiment and to be able to better treat that pain. Of course, you put yourself in the place of the animal, and you tell yourself that no one likes it when people mess up and hurt us. So therefore, we do everything to make sure that it's done quickly and efficiently. In the first months of their training, there is sometimes a bit of reticence, a little fear which is perfectly normal. Rats, for example, aren't easy animals, but you see very quickly that by teaching them the right gestures and at the same time giving them the philosophy of respect for the animal and of well-being, giving them a lot of advice, you can see that these young people are highly motivated by this profession. The restraint is good. On the other hand, what is less good the, the animal head up, don't lie down, there you are. Voilà. Before doing anything else, we'll spend five minutes on stroking them well. That's caressing, as the English say, up and down quietly, you see. It's like making bread. Away we go. Now, what I'm giving you here are empty gel capsules. There's no active ingredient, of course. It's simulated so you can learn the movement, maybe to each. That might not be a bad idea. Hey, it's not worth asking for the animal's permission too much. So open them from above there. No, no, with the other hand. Are you left-handed? No, right-handed. OK, well, right hand here. Hand here, like this. Fold back the skin, inside, right inside. Let go now, and you can easily put the gel capsule in. Did you manage it or not? Ah, voilà. Ah, look at Doggy. Look at those cheeky things. There, you're a little clown. That means you haven't sufficiently. You see, you haven't gone deep enough. Go right down. Push it there. Bien au fond. Enfonce bien. Voilà. So, we can carry on being nice at the same time. Once that's over, it isn't finished. You finish the move, but the caress is a reward as well. You have to be close to the animal with a maximum of contact. It's really essential. The 
relations that I fear the most are, honestly, with dogs, because in the end, they're animals which are really close to us. Right well, here they're on their second anesthesia session. Last time they saw how different parts of the isoflurane machine work. They saw the principles by which it functions, the points where you need to check. So next, today it's really the first session where they'll learn, after a demonstration, how to anesthetize the animal. Remember this now, if it knocks out little by little the paws, ears and the tail, if that's asleep, think that the animal is starting to lack oxygen. The main species we use here are rats, mice, rabbits and dogs, which represent about 95% of the animal species used in experimentation. Rabbits get stressed easily, so well. We're going underneath the chin and then an abdominal massage in order to, of course, relax the animal. Always the way we act towards most species, and the rabbit likes that a lot. Well, it's an animal that has heart attacks when it's stressed, like pigs do as well. They're very sensitive subjects from a cardiovascular point of view. You've got five to ten injections to make on the animal. So there's no special need for restraints. The animal's not suffering. It's a very soft kind of injection. We're not asking you to undress the rabbit. Now you're going to prepare your syringes and make ten injections over a surface of about ten centimetres. You have to know how to make an intradermal injection. It's a very simple thing, as you could see, and the main discipline which uses these injections is immunology. The training philosophy is, of course, about learning, in this case about gestures, how to hold an animal, how to, how can I put it, contain the animal, how to inject them, but to respect them beyond that. That means right up to euthanasia. I think it's really vital to train people to be responsible for their actions. Regular contact with the animals is essential, you see. We can say that field training is our strong point, and I think that being constantly present with the animals for basic care and other things is really necessary. And this is both the application of the lessons, but also the learning of a craft. Go on, give them a good stroke, that's why we're here. Go on, you have to caress them. This is very important for laboratory animals, which are in a box. Well, sometimes they need contact. Your turn. Caressing animals, being with them, it's a way of compensating them for the difficulties faced by these animals when they're being studied. They're happy, they're happy to see people. Socialising dogs, this is our professional ethic. But it's above all made compulsory by European and national regulations. It's clear that using alternative methods is a great step forward. Now only a few alternative tests have been validated to replace animal experimentation. It's now an obligation to use alternative testing when it has been validated in relation to an animal model. We can say that these are complementary methods which are important and inseparable from the use of animal models. An approach which successfully unites alternative methods and reduced use of laboratory animals can be seen in some domains of medical research.
Thus, in cardiovascular medicine, it's important to understand the origin of heart rhythm problems and their mechanisms. For that, we must decode how the electric potential which makes our heart beat spreads out in real time in the cardiac muscle, or evaluate the impact of arterial pressure and blood flow. Such research can be made partly on isolated cells and on animals like the pig, physiologically close to humans. But they take time, are costly, and only give partial results. Today, mathematical modeling and computer simulation are opening up new perspectives. Frédéric Jabot is a researcher at the National Institute for Research in Computer Science and Control. His challenge consists of trying to translate the way our organs function into mathematical formula. His current research is more specifically on the heart, the arteries and blood circulation. This image really captures our work. We're trying to make an equation for physical phenomena. Here you have an equation which models blood flow, and here the behavior of the cardiac muscle or an artery wall. In this simulation, we've represented blood flow in the left ventricle of the heart, which arrives here through the mitral valves and is ejected into the rest of the circulation through the aortic valves. The research we're doing allows or will allow us to reduce animal experimentation because through digital simulation you can with great ease examine a large number of cases by varying the problem's parameters. And straight away you need less experiments on animals because many scenarios have already been envisaged using the machine. Some sick people have pulmonary arteries which are too dilated and we're working with a doctor who has dreamed up a device for reducing the diameter of the artery. Here you have four cases of four different patients. Obviously this device will be tested on animals before it is implanted in humans. Our work here is to model and then perform experiments on the computer before making experiments on animals. To be able to model all the organism with all of its very complex reactions at once on the cellular level, the tissue level and in the organs, today that's still science fiction. It's more than just to be looked forward to, it's still science fiction. But the process of development of alternative methods is at work. In decades to come, by combining the benefits of different scientific disciplines, biology, medical imaging, computer modeling, it is likely that animal experimentation will only be used for a minority of research. You can imagine it, of course but rather like a film set in the future, that one day we will construct a kind of biological robot that will allow us, in a completely digital fashion, to vary all the biological constants and into which we can introduce a new substance and watch the results. We may get there, but for the moment, it's a long way off.